If there's one person who embodies neuroendocrine tumors in America, it's Dr. Richard Warner. Dr. Warner is the grand old man, and I mean that with love, not with, with derogatory. He's the grand old man of neuroendocrine tumors. I believe, if I'm correct, he wrote his first paper on carcinoid in 1958 when he was a fellow. Is that right? 55, missed it by three years. I knew he'd, he'd, get, he'd keep me straight. That's, he's been doing that for the last 20 years. So Dr. Warner, come up and talk about carcinoid and related neuroendocrine tumors, the basics. He's gonna start at the beginning and take you up where you need to know. Thank you, Gene. Just point straight ahead to change slides. Flattery will get you everywhere with me. <laughs> I extend my own welcome to this group. I see so many familiar faces, uh, so I welcome students, patients, friends, colleagues, and whoever else you are that's, that's here. Uh, we've been involved with you since the beginning of recognition in the United States of carcinoid. And uh, uh, one thing I would point out to you, though, which is self-evident, you're a very mixed group. Some of you are very medically sophisticated, having studied biological things in school. Others have never even taken a course in basic biology. So lecturing to you on the basics is a very me a mixed thing. I don't want to speak over the head, over your heads uh, of those who might not be so cognizant, and yet I don't want to speak underneath your ability to others. We'll mix it up, but I would ask to everybody, if you don't understand or have a question, write it down We'll have a nice long question and answer period afterwards, and you can ask the most elementary or the most complex questions at that time. Now, one, uh, one thing I would say, colleagues such as Gene Waltring and I often agree on everything, but sometimes we disagree, and the experts are not always of the same opinion. And we do have our own ways of settling differences of opinion. <laughs> and it works. All right, now let's begin by pointing out what the difference is between the, the various neuroendocrine tumors. Here we see a picture of a group of dogs. They're all canines, the canine family, but they're different breeds. So similarly, neuroendocrine tumors are a family of tumors, but they're different types. Carcinoid happens to be the commonest, uh, compo comprising about 75% of all neuroendocrine tumors. The other tumors mostly arise in the pancreas or in the upper intestine, and they're called NETs or neuroendocrine tumors, but so are carcinoids now. So sometimes the terms are interchangeable. All the body is made of cells, just like a house may be made of bricks except unlike bricks, which are permanent and unchanging until they de deteriorate, cells are ever always in the course of renovation. They die and they're replaced all, all the time. That process of scheduled or planned uh, demise of bo uh, body cells is called apoptosis and this is very important for the development of cancer or carcinoid. And here we see uh, an outline of a characteristic cell. Remember there are 
several, more than 100 specialized cells in the body, each type designed for a particular function, heart cells to contract, cells in the eye to be sensitive to light, and so on. And, but all cells have certain things in common. They have a, a, a cytoplasm, that is their content uh, uh, within the, the uh, um, membrane that surrounds the cell, and a nucleus, the center, in which the chromosomes or chromatin material is stored, where the genes are located, and in every single cell, that blueprint of the entire body in all animals or, 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 and vegetables or living organisms, no matter what they are, their entire structure is uh, present in the uh, chromosomal material that's in their nucleus. And we're going to say a few words about this because it's becoming increasingly important in the dealing with carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumors. As you see, genes are messengers. They're, they're not only the blueprint, but the way of activating the, uh, these uh, plans. And they consist of uh, like beads on a necklace the necklace being the chromosome, and the genes are the beads along the course of that necklace. And the chromosome is made up of DNA, the oxyribonucleic acid, which has along it amino acids that extend like rungs of a ladder across the two strands that are twisted in the double helix that comprises the, the uh, DNA of a chromosome. And that has over 100,000 genes in each nucleus in the human body. The bases, that is like the rungs of a ladder, that go from one strand to the other strand of the chromosome comprise over 72 million in number. Normally, cells, as I said, are in the process of dying or replicating, but not all at the same time, of course. And that process is called the cell cycle. Mitosis is the process by which the cells replicate themselves. And there is one phase in the cell cycle when they're rest at rest, nothing is happening. And it's during these different phases that we can see the changes on biopsy and we can tell if a cell is in mitosis. You will hear more about this from one of my following speakers. During the cell cycle, when the the DNA is being uh, uh, processed in the chromosomes. The amino acids, the sequence of them, gets transmitted, but errors can occur. There may be depletions, there may be additions, there may be other types of errors, and these sometimes will cause a problem in the development of the cell that's being made and hence we may get nothing, no, no change, we may get it tolerated, we may get some malformation, or we may get a problem in replication, and so cancer may develop. And here's an example in the, in the plant world, a pumpkin, monstrously big because of a mutation in its genetics. And so, in, in essence, this resulted in what you might call cancer of the pumpkin. <laughs> and here in, in, in human cells is 
epi uh, a representation of apoptosis. We won't go into the details of it, but we'll mention again how cancer develops. It's because the perpetuation with each division, each mitosis, of a defect, of a mutation. And when the body can't repair it, then they, the cells continue to multiply, and the result is an overgrowth of that type of cell, which we then know as cancer. And as you can see, the, uh, on the, the stain, here, we can tell which cells are undergoing mitosis by special staining, and then we can also stain them for Ki67, a protein which will show up only when the cells are in process or preparing to undergo mitosis. So it can tell us how rapidly the growth is occurring. This is very important in clinical use, and again, you'll hear more about this. Now let's become more clinical. About 75%, as I said, of all neuroendocrine tumors are carcinoids, and 25% or a little bit more are other types of neuroendocrine tumors. Some are functioning, that is to say, they produce an excess of a hormone of whatever the type is that was normally produced by the cell of origin of that tumor, or they may be non-functioning. They don't produce any special hormone and cause no hormonal symptoms. For example, if the cells that make insulin in the beta cells in the pancreas overgrow, then we get what's called an insulinoma, an insulin-producing neuroendocrine tumor, and that causes symptoms of an excess of insulin, which we know as hypoglycemia, and so on with the other, uh, the other types of tumors. We have a tumor called a pancreatic polypeptidoma, or PPOMA, which makes too much of that material, but that material doesn't cause symptoms. So it's a non-functioning tumor. Gastrinoma makes gastrin, a hormone that stimulates stomach acid, and so we call that a gastrinoma, and so on with the other names you see there. Now, about 64 percent, this is approximate, of, the, of neuroendocrine tumors or carcinoids arise in the digestive tract. About 28 percent or so arise in the lung, and that's increasing currently in, in the statistics, and the, the remaining 8 percent arise from all different places. A primary can occur in the breast, in the prostate, and in almost in any place. I even heard of a couple of cases from which a, a, a neuroendocrine tumor or a carcinoid arose from the cerumen gland of the ear. Looking at the other neuroendocrine tumors again, which I've mentioned before, you see here listed their names. There are more than this, though. Almost any endocrine gland, any hormonal producing group of cells can give rise to a neuroendocrine tumor. We can have tumors that produce growth hormone and can cause acromegaly or gigantism. That's usually from the pituitary gland, but it can occur from the uh, pancreas and so on with all, uh, the many different hormones that can arise in that uh, location. We also have a group of, of neuroendocrine tumors that are inherited. They're hereditary. 
this is very unusual, though, only comprising some 4 to 6 percent of all the neuroendocrine tumors. The co commonest of this rare group are the MENs, multiple endocrine neoplasia, a group in which there's pituitary tumors, adrenal uh, or uh, um, parathyroid tumors, and sometimes pancreatic or pulmonary carcinoids. And then we have these other very unusual syndromes from Hippo-Lindau, neurofibromatosis, and tuberosclerosis. There are families with the, these entities which also have neuroendocrine tumors accompanying them. And finally, and I'll say more about it later, is the very recently discovered familial carcinoid. That's a, a group of patients in which carcinoids of the small intestine, the common carcinoid, seems to be transmitted. And this was only first really reported uh, and, and with convincing evidence a, a year ago, last July. And uh, uh, we will say more about it because it's still an investigation but if it's valid as it looks to be, then that will be more common than, what, than the other inherited entities and will be increasingly important. Now, what is the frequency with which all these gastric cancers and carcinoids occur? As you can see, the commonest by far is ordinary cancer of the colon and rectum. But next to that are neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see about one-tenth the frequency uh, will be devoted to them. But yet that's more than the combination of uh, gastric and pancreatic cancers uh, together. So it's not, it's not as rare as we thought. And the extent of disease at the diagno time of diagnosis varies dependent upon where the tumor arises. As you can see from the rectum, most of the tumors are very local and they're found, well, they're very small. And that's usually because of the frequency with which we're now doing colonoscopies or flexible sigmoidoscopies. So these little tiny wart-like growths are seen and can be removed while they're still innocuous. On, in the lung, almost half are already spread by the, uh, by the time they're first diagnosed. And those in the intestine, the, the, the classic carcinoid, 29% only are, are uh, without metastases when they're found. So they're not found early, they're found late, usually as you see five to seven years on the average after symptoms have appeared. And most of them are misdiagnosed first. When somebody has an occasional stomach ache, you don't immediately do MRIs and CAT scans and colonoscopies, it gets treated in a simple simplified fashion and doesn't appear again for many months and then you might again slough it off a little bit. So it, it usually is delayed in diagnosis to the detriment of the patient. And here we see the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors by location and especially what's been happening lately, which ones are being diagnosed more often. And you see lung, small bowel, and rectum are increasing considerably in their frequency. I don't think that's because we have an epidemic of these, but rather better diagnostic methods, and we're doing more endoscopies, for example. Now, here the most common one, the intestine. This is a piece of small bowel that's been sliced open after being removed. And you see these little nodule wart-like growths. And these are these little polyps 
are carcinoids, and they don't look bad, very bad, but if you cross-section them, you can see the, the surface is the membrane uh, that lines the intestine, and underneath that, the yellowish material is the tumor submucosal, but it extends through the muscular layer. You see the little strands all the way through to the serosa, that's the inner lining of the, of the intestine. So this tumor goes through and through the whole thickness of the wall. It can't be removed by a, a, a endoscopy, for example, because you leave a hole in the bowel. You have to take out that section of the intestine. Usually, carcinoids are characterized by very slow growth. There are exceptions, but most of them are slow. At least 20% or more metastasize. The frequency or likelihood of metastasis is dependent upon the size of the tumor when it's first diagnosed. If tumor is over two centimeters, there's more than a 50-50 chance that it has spread, or even if it's not been found to be spread, when it's removed, the likelihood of a, an unrecognized microscopic spread is 50-50, so it may show up at a later time. This carcinoid syndrome, which is a constellation of features characterized or caused by the production of excessive amounts of serotonin and probably other material from the tumor. Uh, it does not occur in all of these cases, at the most 40%, but usually less, less frequent than that, and we'll, we'll talk more on that in a few moments. The standard way of seeing these tumors, imaging techniques, are standard straight x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, ultrasound, isotope bone studies. The gold standard for 25 years has been the Octrio scan, but now it's going to be replaced by the gallium scan, which is still uh, experimental, but within a year or so is going to be widespread in its use in the United States. It has replaced the Octrio scan in Europe for so several years. And then we also have a combination of fusion of uh, a Creo scan and a CAT scan and the MIBG scan, and we should hear something more about that later today. For the pancreas, EUS, endoscopic ultrasound scan, it's a scan with high-frequency sound waves that are like radar that's carried out with a scope, like a gastroscope, and that can pick up little lesions in the pancreas. It is a semi-invasive procedure, but it's very effective in diagnosing and even allowing often the biopsy of any lesions in the pancreas. We have the wireless capsule or pill camera, a device, a little, big, a little pill you swallow that takes pictures of the lining of your intestine as it passes through, sends them to a, a receiver, a device you wear for a whole day, and then those pictures are played back and we can identify lesions. It's not 100% foolproof, but it's pretty good and can see small things. And then more recently, we have double balloon or even single balloon enteroscopy. It's a device with a balloon on the end of a gas, uh, a long flexible scope, which can allow it to be advanced almost all the way through the small bowel. And we'll show you more on that in a few moments. Here is one little representation of the gallium scan, and you should hear more on this later. As you see on the left is the Octrio scan, the dark, uh, uh, image is the liver where normally a lot of this material is accumulated so it appears dark and the little sp 
black specks are tumor deposits. And you see on the right, the gallium scan, so many more are seen that are not seen on the Octrio scan. It's up to 10 times as sensitive and can pick up little lesions. Also, occasionally, there are false positives, other lesions, scar tissue that's freshly inflamed, for example, can give a positive. So it's not a 100% and we're learning how to identify what's, what's real and what's a misrepresentation. And here we have CAT scan and MRI, two different techniques of seeing the tumors. And you see the big round lesions in the liver on both. And here is a sonogram, ultrasound scan of the uh, rectal carcinoid. And the, the, the center uh, at the bottom is a little tiny rectal carcinoid in the lining of, of the image, the lining of the rectum. And that helps to tell you the depth to which this lesion has grown. And we often will use this technique when we find a little one before we take it out to make sure that it hasn't extended deeper and requires a more extensive resection. Now, here's a representation of the double balloon, how it would be passed through it with a colonoscope all the way through the colon from the rectum and then threaded up into the distal part of the small bowel. And here's the actual instrument. What happens is the scope is inserted, the balloons are collapsed, and then one balloon is blown up and it, so it holds the tip of the scope in a, in, a, in a secure area in the intestine. The scope can be advanced, and then the balloon is de decompressed, and the next balloon is, is inflated. And so, you, like an accordion, you can shear the intestine up around the scope, and you can work it up into the, through the uh, long length of the intestine. And through that scope, you can pass a, a biopsy uh, snare, uh, device, a punch biopsy, and take a little pinch of tumor. And here's a same, similar development with a single balloon. This is a demanding technique, and not every doctor knows how to do it. So, it, has to require a specialist. Here's a representation of a carcinoid in the small intestine seen by that technique. And here is a carcinoid in the stomach seen on a regular gastroscopy. And here you see the bulge. This is the appearance on a pill camera image or the wireless capsule and endoscopy. Now, what are the ways that a regular, ordinary mid-gut carcinoid would present? The commonest is abdominal pain. At first, it's intermittent at wide intervals then there may be evidences of obstruction, and then there may be bleeding, or there may be a mass, a lump that's felt for the first time. I've had patients come to me and say, I feel this bump in my belly, what's it mean? And it's already a, a big carcinoid. Or it's not felt and the doctor in a routine exam feels it. Or finally, and least common as the presenting feature, are the, is the carcinoid syndrome, flushing or, or uh, severe diarrhea, and uh, that has to be thought of. It's not always thought of right away. That's why the zebra is the, uh, is the icon for carcinoid, because when doctors see or hear familiar symptoms, they think of familiar things. 
So you hear hoofbeats, you think of horses, but you've got to think outside the box. It could be a zebra, a carcinoid. All we have to do is think of it, then you can do the right test to confirm it. Occasionally, and sometimes more often, dependent on the nature of the surgery, carcinoid or other neuroendocrine tumor is found just coincidental with uh, evaluation for some other disease. Surgery for gallstones turns up with carcinoid being present also, or surgery for some, something else like a, a rectal carcinoid, uh, a rectal cancer turns up a carcinoid also. Very often there are two different types of lesions. Now the carcinoid syndrome itself. There are major and minor features, and as I say, these are due mainly to the hormonal produce, products of the tumor. We may get flushing. It's interesting, special flushing, because it's dry. There's not a heavy sweat with it. It's not a cold and clammy one, but it's bright red, and usually, at least initially, limited to the face and sometimes the front of the neck. We may get diarrhea in about 75% of cases. It may be very severe. It may be watery. It may be intermittent. And it's not very uh, frequent at first. It's a gradual onset. We may, there's a disease called pellagra. It's a deficiency of, of one of the B vitamins uh, and that's because tryptophan, which is uh, an amino acid that we get from our diet, and we can't make it, it gets gobbled up to make serotonin, and so it doesn't get to make vitamin B, uh, B and, and, and niacin, and uh, deficiency of, of that causes pellagra. Pellagra we saw during World War II in prisoners of war who were starved, and it's characterized by sensitivity to sun with a dark pigment rash. It's also characterized by mental changes and also by diarrhea. And if you have carcinoid syndrome with diarrhea, you don't need the diarrhea of pellagra on top of it. Therefore, in order to prevent this, which is very easy, we just feed people an extra amount of niacin. And then we don't see this problem too much in the United States because our bread and other food products are loaded by law with vitamin supplements. But in areas where there's a deficiency of this, it's more common. But it's very easy to routinely take extra niacin. It's even present in many of the multiple vitamin preparations. Uh, or other features, we get little blood vessels on the nose and the cheeks, venous telangiectasia. Uh, we may get asthma, bronchospasm. Uh, we may get, uh, in, in uh, neglected cases, where the elevated blood levels of serotonin are persistent for a long time, we may get damage to the valves of the heart. It used to be a, a a finding in about 50% of carcinoid syndrome patients. It's less so now. And then finally, many cases will have an enlarged liver because of the spread of tumors. These are the major features. The minor features may be peptic ulcers, low blood level of albumin, muscle wasting, uh, joint pains, uh, scarring fibrosis, uh, and edema of the legs and elevated blood sugar. If you have diabetes and you get carcinoid syndrome, the diabetes will get worse. So a clue to carcinoid syndrome being present is if unexplained worsening of diabetes occurs. Now there is such thing as carcinoid crisis and that's a severe paroxysmal attack like carcinoid syndrome, 
but characterized by severe changes in blood pressure, usually a fall in blood pressure, even shock. In very rare instances, the pressure may go up. Uh, there will be a rapid heartbeat, weakness, collapse, trouble breathing, maybe a flush, and heart failure. This can occur when the, the, the carcinoid tumor is provoked by a epinephrine, adrenaline, whether that be given externally, exogenously by an injection, for example, in, uh, in uh, a local anesthetic that the dentist may use for working on your teeth, or it may occur during the induction of anesthesia for surgery, and this has to be protected against. And so patients with carcinoid, even if they haven't had features of carcinoid syndrome, must be given uh, a somatostatin analog, uh, such as octreotide, before any surgery or any provocative procedure to protect against this carcinoid crisis. This is a representation of the natural course of most neuroendocrine tumors, such as carcinoid. And as you see, it goes over many decades, and at first the symptoms are vague, and then as metastases extend, we begin to get symptoms, diarrhea and flushing, but that's only at the end of the course. It's not at the beginning. So it takes a long time and progresses. We have to think of this diagnosis sooner, and then we might be able to make an earlier diagnosis and better treatment. Some of the ways we can do is measuring the products or the substances themselves of these hormones re released by the tumors into the circulation. Urine 5-HIAA, 5-hydroxy, indole acetic acid, which is the waste product. We can measure that in the, in the blood plasma now also. Blood serotonin can actually be measured, and that's a big help. And nobody, absolutely nobody, has carcinoid syndrome without having an elevated blood serotonin. Chromogranin A has received lots of attention, and it's good, but it's not invariably abnormal due to carcinoid syndrome. There are a number of things that can elevate it, and if time permits, I'll go into that. Other markers, neuron-specific NLA substance B, pancreatic polypeptide, pancreastatin, you'll hear more about. I particularly like that. I think that it has a good ability to help prognose. And neurokinin A. We also have alpha and beta subunits of human chorionic gonadotropin. In chromogranin A, you can get elevation of the blood levels in people with impaired kidney function, impaired liver function, who are on proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec, Nexium, uh, Pantoprazole, et cetera. So that, that would negate the, the validity of any finding uh, in it regarding carcinoid. If, the, if you eat, it'll elevate the value, so it has to be on a fasting specimen. If there's retained stomach antrum after gastric surgery, uh, if you have uh, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, as in gastronoma, if you have inflammatory bowel disease, very active Crohn's disease, that can give an elevation. And finally, under severe stress, like if you run a marathon, or if you are very upset psychologically, you may get an elevated value. This is the metabolic pathway from, of tryptophan to 5-HIA we talked about. Now finally, treatment. Uh, what are the treatments? Well, there are three categories. Supportive things, surgery, which is the only way that's curative at present, and anti-proliferative, that is treatment to inhibit the, the growth of the tumors. The anti-proliferative treatment 
could be biotherapy, such as somatostatin analogs. We know them as octreotide or lanreotide, and alpha interferon, which used to be used more. It's still used somewhat. And then various types of radiotherapy, external beam radiotherapy, uh, radioiodine, um, microspheres, little my, uh, uh, microscopic particles that are injected into the, uh, via a catheter into the hepatic artery to get lodged in the tumors in the liver and give intensive localized radiotherapy. Or finally, PRRT, peptide receptor uh, radionuclide therapy, which is uh, coming to the United States probably within this year and you'll hear more about that later, and it's a very good treatment, and it uses lutetium-177 as the isotope. And then finally, we have chemotherapy, the standard older methods, which are uh, DNA poisons, toxins, and those that are targeted and just go to inhibit enzyme actions in the different growth metabolic pathways within the cell. You'll hear more about that. There are some studies that have been done that uh, lend us to how we practice. For example, the PROMID study, which is an eponym that stands for the name of uh, a trial for octreotide uh, that was carried out and shows that there's a uh, inhibition of tumor growth besides of the hormonal symptoms in carcinoid and some of the other neuroendocrine tumors. Clarinet study similarly shows something of the same nature for lanreotide, and these are mentioned because they are the basis for the use of these drugs for this purpose. And here's an example of the inner workings of a clock if you drop a piece of gravel into the clock, it's going to clog up the wheels and won't work. So chemotherapy works somewhat like this, clogging up the chain of reactions necessary for cellular growth and hence delay, deters uh, new tumor for, uh, cell formation. Everlimus uh, has, re has recently been approved for neuroendocrine tumors, including midgut and lung, and uh, it's something you'll hear more about today. The same thing holds for sunitinib. And here's another technique. This is the hepatic artery, and you see those round cannonballs. Those are hypervascular tumors, met metastases of carcinoid in the liver, and the dye that's injected shows them up, and similarly, medicine can be injected in the same way and will selectively go to those areas. It may be radioisotope particles, or it may be chemotherapy. And here, just to mention the PRRT I, 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 I spoke about a moment ago. It, the, the Netter One study has just been completed, and it's in the hands of the FDA now who are about to approve it for general use. So we can conclude that over the last five years, and it's only recent, there have been very many more productive diagnostic and treatment modalities than there were for a good number of years before. And therefore, the future is increasingly promising for carcinoid net patients. Thank you.